Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Don't Risk It podcast presented by VFIS Client Risk Solutions. This program focuses on the exposures our clients frequently encounter and discusses the potential solutions to help reduce these exposures. I'm your host, Chris Rogers, with VFIS Client Risk Solutions, and today we're talking with David Givett from the law offices of David J. Givett and the Legal Guardian in Palm Desert, California. One of the foundations of David's practice focuses on EMS defense, and David is here to provide some insight on some issues he's observed in his defense of EMS organizations. David, I want to thank you for joining me, and it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Uh, The pleasure is mine, I assure you. Good to hear, good to hear. So can you give us a little background uh, into your practice and why you're so passionate about EMS? Yeah, of course. So my, my, my practice actually, you know, even though I, I've been practicing for 15 years, my practice goes back to the late 80s when I became a paramedic and, and spent, you know, almost to the turn of the century running 911 calls. Uh, EMS was very quickly, be, you know, became my first love. And um, that is where my heart lies. That's where my soul lives, right? That's where all my ashes scattered after I die. You know, that's EMS is, is effectively who I am. So once I had done it and worked my way up and out, when I became a lawyer, from the, from the first minute of my first day in law school, I knew that protecting and defending EMS providers was what I wanted to do. And so that is the same approach that I take with every client, with every case. And I, I effectively treat it like a an emergency patient, right? I do a full assessment. I I process all the algorithms and the protocols and and handle it in the best possible way for the best possible outcome. So the, the two, believe it or not, are very tightly um, woven together and it's just kind of who I am. So are you are you still active in uh, in emergency services, or has just life gotten in the way and and, and too to uh, not enough time to to still do that? Yeah, no. So I think when when I was studying for the bar exam, I really had to to make a difficult decision and extricate myself from the street and really focus on doing the law, and that's what I had to do. So I don't I don't practice so much anymore. I do preach, but I don't right, practice right. Uh, anymore. Hey, I, I'm, I'm guessing the bar would take a little bit of focus and, and working 24 bit. hour shifts might take away from that. <laughs> For sure. So let's, uh, let's get into the, you know, the nuts and bolts of the conversation. Um, sure. You know, how can phrases and terminology uh, used in patient care reports be, uh, be used against an organization? And, and I'll give you an example. I, uh, I, I'm follically challenged and I got a little bit of a belly. So uh, if someone referred to me as the, the chubby bald guy in a PCR, um, you know, how could that reflect negatively on an organization? So it's, it's, it's a difficult dance that we have to do with documentation, right? Um, certainly we have to document the truth. We have to document what happened. We have to document honestly and, and, and with regard for, for the facts and, you, you know, a, a chubby bald guy or a big butt lady might be true. Um, but if it doesn't advance the narrative, if it doesn't advance the story that you're trying to tell, then all it does is look bad on you when it's projected up on a screen in a courtroom. The entire the entire purpose of, of a PCR narrative should be to give the reader the opportunity to, to get it not only understand what happened, but get a feel for what happened on the call, who said what, who did what. Um, and if such a descriptor will help advance the story, then by all means. Now, the dance part comes in where <laughs> writing, a, writing a narrative definitely serves a patient care purpose, and that's got to be top of mind. But it's also got to be able to refresh your recollection, because if you're testifying in court about a call you went on two years ago that you've got no earthly recollection of, the way the narrative is written and the content of the narrative is what's going to refresh your recollection. So chubby bald guy or big butt lady might have some, have some value, um, but it just doesn't belong there. It's not professional. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Two years later and you, you pull that, that, uh, line out of context and you're sure. having to, and you're having to remember that report, um, you know, basically by reading it, it's going to, it's going to reflect poorly on you if, if, if that's the type of thoughts that are going through your mind at that call to, to, you know, to be labeling people that. 
Yeah, of course. And, and think about what the cross examination is going to be like on that, right? There, the entire. If I was the if I was the attorney cross examining that, my spin would be: Well, clearly you didn't have regard or compassion for the patient. If you're if you are demonstrably denigrating them in your report, that must and I wink to the jury. Carry over to the to the level of care you provided. Wink to the jury. So it, it all matters. It's, it's about that perception in front of that authority having jurisdiction. Yeah. Yes. So can we dig a little bit deeper into, um, you know, proper documentation and information and, and go from a, a patient refusal perspective? Can, can you talk about the importance of uh, proper documentation when we have a, a refusal scenario? So you got to remember that the refusal, as far as medical calls go, the refusal is about the most dangerous because you're going to turn around and leave. And when you do that, all of the liability, all of the risk, all of the you know, potential problems remain on scene for the universe to do with what it will. Um, the only way to to adequately protect both yourself and believe me, I'm selfish. I, I want I want the provider to be protected um, is to is to fully and comprehensively potentially even over document right, which I don't advocate, but but really document the heck out of it um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, you can't do that without having actually done all of the things that need to be done. The assessment, the conversation in, in its various forms. And, uh, number two, providing the patient the opportunity to do the right thing, which is in my humble opinion, should be one of the primary focuses of a refusal, right? It's not just, oh, you don't want to go, sweet, I don't want to take you, sign here. If if your clinical judgment is truly an AMA, meaning against medical advice, meaning you think that person should go, then the inherent responsibility is to do everything within your power to convince them to make the right decision, which is to go to the hospital. That's what needs to be reflected in the narrative. Because that's the only place it's going to live. Not just they didn't want to go; they said no, signed it, and, and here we go. We, you, you, yeah, and there's there's so there's there's probably in the millions of those calls over the years where providers said, "Oh, you don't want to go? Well, I don't want to take you. See ya." Yeah, and it didn't end well, for sure. And, and I'm sure there's some providers that, um, you know, might have, you know kind of initiated a, a refusal because they late at night want to get back to sleep. And, and, uh, so those are, um, you know, instances where we definitely need to reinforce to get that documentation on a, on a refusal. Oh, oh, a hundred percent. And every agency has at least one, right? I mean, it, it's not a, it's not a, a, an uncommon phenomenon. It's out there everywhere. So let's talk about, um, you know, cameras. We have to go under the presumption that we're, you know, constantly being recorded uh, in, you know, in 2023. Um, but let's talk about uh, the importance of keeping personal cameras away from the scene uh, and, you know, how social media exposure is associated with posting some of those scenes. Uh, photos could come back to bite us. Yeah. So th this is a huge, huge area. And my my assessment of it is that technology and the ability to do these things has grown faster than the maturity level of EMS providers. Um, and it, it should be obvious to anybody, you don't take a photograph of a scene and then post it for the public to see. Uh, but clearly, you know, clearly that's, that message hadn't been getting across because so many people, especially early on, like in the late, in the mid to late nineties, when the internet and the ability to take digital photography really started to pick up. Um, but now in 2023, it's kind of a different animal. We have to assume just as regular people, you, me, everybody, we have to assume that the minute we leave our homes until the minute we return, not only are we being video recorded, but that that video recording is being broadcast somehow to the entire world because that's the reality of it and if you if you pare that down to the ems context you have to assume that on you know every provider has to assume that on, on every call they too are being recorded so everything they do everything they say every bit of their conduct is not only being documented but being broadcast uh and being judged and that's one, that's one element of the animal, but the other one, the bigger one 
is some scenes are exciting, right? Some crashes are just too gnarly not to take a picture of. But as soon as a provider takes a photograph or captures a video um, or does really anything to gather data on his or her own personal device, then that device and all of its content become discoverable, meaning that in any legal action that you never saw coming, your phone, your tablet, your whatever device could be subpoenaed and uh, and and rifled through and forensically examined for things much more than just much more than just the call. The third prong and 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 the the dangerous part with that dangerous the, the the part where this all comes together is there in my opinion is a great inherent value in being able to photograph and video scenes and calls. I mean think of think of a high speed center impact passenger space intrusion traffic collision. You could write about that and you could document it and you could describe it. But what better way to communicate the gravity of that particular scene to a trauma surgeon than a photograph and or a video? Um, telemedicine is another thing that's going to, you know, that, that, that's coming, uh, be, be becoming very popular. Um, all of those things. So there is a value, but with it, you know, with great responsibility, you know, with, 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 uh, with great power comes great responsibility, right? So Absolutely. with it now, we have to be very careful about HIPAA compliance and what device is it captured on and who has dominion over it and how does it get transmitted? So it's still a very wide open thing. There, there's, there's risks, but I think the rewards are greater if it's done thoughtfully. Did I, did I over answer that question? <laughs> no, because it is such a, there's so many moving parts to it. Like you said, there's value that, that video and photos can, can provide to an agency, but there's also some very negatives that video and photos can, can, yeah. can provide to an agency. It just all depends on where those things are housed, how they're used. Uh, so it's not a, it's not a, you know, a 30 second answer that you give. I think you had to go yeah. into that, uh, that amount of detail. Well, good. Thank you. <laughs> I feel better now. Good to hear. Good to hear. <laughs> so let's say, uh, you know, you and I are, are, are partners and we're out on a call and, 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 you know, you're doing good and, and not, not videoing or anything like that, but, uh, I'm the bad apple in the bunch and, and I'm, um, I'm recording at the scene. Could, uh, you know, could a, could a provider be vicariously liable for, uh, something that, uh, you know, one their partners, uh, do on a scene. Now, I know this could be, this is going to vary by jurisdiction and things like that, but can you speak to that generally? So generally speaking, yes, right? Generally speaking, each provider has a duty to the patient, to the scene, to quality, to policies, protocols, procedures, right? And each provider is it has a duty to high to high quality, right? To do it the right way, the way it's supposed to be done. If any provider knows or, or reasonably should know that any policy is being violated or, or, or anything along those lines, there is an absolute duty. And if they don't do something, even, even as, even as, as subtle as, as anonymously reporting or whatever it is, then yes, of course they too could be subject to liability for not interfering on behalf of the patient. Remember more than anything, Above all, EMS providers are patient advocates. And if one partner is doing something contrary to the interest of patient advocacy and the other partner knows about it and doesn't do anything, it's the same as if they're both doing it. So we've talked quite a bit about documentation, so, and I'm going to ask uh, another question in that area. Sure. Um, can you discuss the importance of written documents to support your operations, you know, to help guide and protect your staff from, from potential pitfalls? You mean like policies and procedures? Like job description, treatment protocols, administrative policies, uh, you know, things like that. So generally speaking, I think it is wise uh, and practical to have a a as much in writing as you possibly can in terms of um, job descriptions, policies with regard to just about anything that requires a policy so that... Um, you know, so that so that the, the the provider agency not only is is potentially covered, you know, from in the face of potential liability, um, but so that each of these things, presumably they're important enough to have a policy, have been considered by intelligent minds. And I'm using air quotes because 
you know. Um, <laughs> right, right. However, the 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 poly you can have a book of policies as thick as the Webster's Dictionary, and it can be filled with nothing but sheer brilliance if you don't train on it and drill on it and test on it and hold providers accountable to it, you might as well not have done it at all. And that's where, that's what I think is, I don't think there's any lack of, of policies and procedures and guidelines and descriptions and instructions uh, in EMS. I, I don't think there's a shortage of that at all. I think what there is a shortage of is training on those um, and the holding of a providers accountable to them. I think that's where the failure is currently. Yeah, we, we see that in the field sometimes where the, the practice that the organization does isn't exactly uh, following what, um, you know, what's written in their procedures. And, you know, if sure. they get into a, um, a litigation situation, most often it's probably going to, they're going to follow how they practice versus what uh, what they have in writing. Is that an accurate assessment? Not only, not only that, <clears throat> but they will take the fact that they are not practicing um, what they have written down and use that against the providers and the agency. So again, that that's why it's so important. You can have policies, but if you're not training to them and holding providers uh, uh, accountable to them, you might as well not have them. Because if if the policy says A and the providers are doing B, then the entire system collapses. And on cross examination or in litigation, for example, um, it's not going to end well. You're not gonna. You're not gonna look very good. I, w- I would think. Not, not even a matter of looking good. You're gonna lose. <laughs> Man, well, I, I don't. I don't mind looking bad and winning. That's okay with me. But you're gonna lose. Yeah, you're. You're definitely in a. In- in somewhat of a win lose uh, win lose uh, industry, so I mean, granted, for sure, there is some settlements, obviously, but and uh, it's a moving target. I wish it was as you know, I wish it was as straightforward as hockey, where you know, whoever has the most goals at the end of the game wins. In this <laughs> industry, it's <laughs> it's a moving target. Yeah, change changes day to day. Uh, so, so one last question: um, Can you comment on, on on dismissal or or grievance procedures? On you know, uh, again, that's probably a documentation thing that you just kind of went into um, with uh, with following our procedures and having them in writing. That that, that I think that kind of dovetails into that. Could you could you speak to that a little bit? I I can try. I can be very general about it, but there are too many. Like not not only are there federal uh, state variables that have to go with federal guidelines, but there are um, union issues and sub issues that fall in the way with that. But generally speaking, documentation wins the day. So for example, California is a is an at will state. So pretty much any non contracted employee can be fired for anything or nothing at all, so long as that reason isn't one of the protected reasons, right? Age, gender, and so forth, religion, so forth. Um, and so California, many California employers, especially private ambulance employers, get really um, complacent when it comes to documentation because they don't want to be held accountable. They want to just be able to terminate employees, uh, you know, at will. And more and more we're seeing that that is, has become problematic because without documentation to substantiate the termination, then employees and their counsel are free to create whatever alternative reason there might have been and without without documentation it's going to be hard to dispute so it's my opinion that in across the board um human resources or employee discipline or qi documentation really needs to be very thorough very clean very objective um but it needs to be done so I think from the 50,000 foot view of it is, is, is document everything that you see because you're going to need that documentation to reinforce, uh, reinforce what you're doing, even in a, a, a you know, a at will uh, state. Correct. And, and, and by the way, it benefits the employee as well, because if the documentation such as it is, is not sufficient, that very same thing could get them their job back or back pay or damages or whatever. So it, it works, I think, it, to me, I think it works for everybody. And if the documentation is they're a substandard provider and they get fired, then good, be gone with them. I, I don't think the field has room for substandard providers. 
Yeah, it just puts a negative um, negative perception on the rest of the providers that are trying to do it. Of right. course, yep. We, each provider is the same as the provider next to them because the the community can't tell the difference, right? You know, one person calls nine one one maybe one time in their life, and whatever that experience they have is, is how they're going to judge every other person in EMS, not only in that field but wherever they go. Yeah, it's 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 one of the worst days of their lives, but it's. Um... To not to sound cold, but it's another day of work for, for the EMS provider. Um, and that's the business we've chosen, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, David, it was a pleasure chatting with you today. I want to thank you for all the great information and, um, and, and hopping on and, and having this conversation with me. I enjoyed it. And if anybody has any other questions or wants any more you know, information, it turns out I wrote a book. Well, give, give us a little information about it. <laughs> Sirens, Lights, and Lawyers is available on Amazon or pretty much anywhere else you, you, you get your books, your eBooks or your hardcover books from. And effectively it's just the law and other really important stuff. EMS providers never learned in school. And it's not written like a set of stereo instructions. It's one provider talking to another about really important stuff. So, um, that I think could be helpful. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to, uh, to uh, pitch that. Oh, for sure. And we'll, we'll also include the, uh, I don't know if we can include a, a link or uh, just the description of it, you know, on, on the name and whatnot, but we'll, we'll reference it in the description of the program. Sure. So it's, uh, if they Google the name, they'll find it. It's everywhere. Perfect. Perfect. Well, again, uh, David, I want to thank you for your time and it was a pleasure chatting with you. Pleasure's all my be amazing. And um, I'll talk to you soon. Hopefully, maybe, I don't know. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, sir. <laughs> See ya. All right. Thanks. And I want to thank you for listening to the program and for your interest in VFIS safety resources. I want to thank our guest, David Givett, once again, for his time and information. Please consider subscribing to our program to stay up to date on new content releases. Also, if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving a review below. For more information about the many resources available from VFIS, please visit VFIS.com. And to submit ideas for future discussions, please reach out by email and VFIS risk control at VFIS.com. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. The views, information, or opinions expressed during this program are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Gladfilter Insurance Group, VFIS, and its employees. Additionally, all views, information, or opinions expressed are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal advice on any subject matter.